Welcome to Invisible Tears. I'm Amanda, one of the co-hosts of Invisible Tears, and today I am here with Drew, one of our other co-hosts. How are you doing, Drew? Good. How are you doing today? Doing good, thanks. And of course, we're here with Jane, our host. Jane, how's it going? I'm doing good. How's it going with you? Doing pretty good. Can't complain. Can't complain. We've all been pretty busy, though. Yeah, we have been crazy. So today, we're going to cover the case of Jessica Briggs, her murder. We can't even call it a cold case because there has actually been someone charged with her murder, but it's an interesting series of events of everything that's happening with her case. So we're going to break it down for you guys. Yeah. So Jessica Briggs um, was found in Portland Harbor in Maine. They believe that she was either killed late May 23rd or early May 24th, 1989, as her body was found at about 1030 in the morning um, along the shoreline within the Portland Harbor. Yeah, she was 16 years old when she was killed, and she was slashed and stabbed to death. Now, one of the interesting pieces is that it has been noted that both her throat was cut almost from ear to ear, and she was also stabbed in the abdomen or sliced in the abdomen, almost eviscerated. I'm sure you guys can put two and two together and understand why we're actually starting to talk or why we're covering her case and actually covering some of the details of her case. Yeah, because her wounds are very similar to Barbara Agnew's in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was around the same time period. So I know early on in our show, we did talk, when we talked to John Philpin, he did mention there being an east-west corridor, not just a north-south corridor. Um, as we're seeing with the Connecticut River Valley killings, it's all north-south. But he thought that there was also murders stretching from the western part of New Hampshire over into Maine. In this case in particular, is the one that they tie to being possibly re- related to the Connecticut River Valley killing based off of her wound pattern and the timing of when she was murdered. Yeah. So now what's really interesting about Jessica's case is that someone was charged, right, with her murder, um, an ex-boyfriend. So Anthony Sanborn Jr. was actually convicted of Jessica's murder back in 1992. And now when Jessica was killed, again, I mentioned that she was 16. Um, Anthony was 16 as well and was an ex-boyfriend. So Maine instantly had him as a suspect. Yes. Yep. Yep. And then there was testimony um, from an ex uh, or roommate of Anthony Sanborn's. Um, his name was Gerard Rossi, and he testified that Anthony admitted to killing Jessica on three different occasions and warned him not to tell anybody. And then there was also a second witness, uh, Hope Cody, who came forward and said that she heard that the night of Jessica's murder, she heard her voice along with another woman's or another girl's voice. Um, And at the time, she had also said that she witnessed Anthony stabbing her 11 or 12 times. Now, the interesting thing is Anthony Sanborn was let out of prison in 2017 yes based off of the testimony from hope cody where she came out and admitted that she gave a false statement Mm -hmm. yeah yeah but it wasn't like she just gave false statement there's so many things that the the prosecution and the authorities did in this case that was just so not only legally, but morally wrong. They had interviewed her at least 10 times extensively. Mm -hmm. And according to her, they yelled at her. They screamed at her. They wanted her to say or identify him as being the one that was there that that murdered uh, Jessica. And she states that they pretty much told her what to put in her statement word for word. Yeah. Unfortunately, you hear about situations like that happening a a lot, just with investigators being so tunnel visioned on a suspect um, that some sort, some sort of, uh, and type of like coercion happens. Yeah. Her exact words were, they basically told me what to say. And she said the detectives frightened her and suggested they would press charges and related to assaults and have her locked up for years if she didn't testify as they instructed. Those were her words. So she did ultimately recant her statement. Yeah. She said they raised their voices. They swore at her. They called her names. So yeah, they, 
pretty much made her say what she said in court and uh and the written statement um when he was convicted right and then in 2017 she recanted everything she felt guilt and she wanted to come clean with um exactly what happened what the detectives did to her said to her made her do and um and so she ended up testifying at his bail hearing they call it Mm -hmm. so um that was one of the things that actually convicted had him convicted and the other thing it was also the roommate drew yep gerard rossi went by jerry rossi and he also recanted his statement also i believe i don't recall seeing that but wasn't able to dig into this case too much not as much as other ones unfortunately I know when um, after he was convicted 20, 25 years later is when they granted him a bail hearing. And he during the hearing, they mostly focused on that Hope Katie and her testi- her testimony in, in 92. And uh, there wasn't any forensics. There wasn't any DNA. Yeah, no murder weapon was ever found. No, no. And he he tried to declare his innocence all these years. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said he was innocent. And during that hearing, the detectives um, denied wrongdoing, like, a lot. There was two detectives. There was uh, Detective Daniels and Detective Young. Because they also failed to release some records to his defense team. That was another thing that was brought up in this hearing for his bail it just seems funny he's let out on bail but it doesn't have a new trial I haven't found a new trial right I haven't found where they're scheduling a new trial he's not been exonerated Um, they've never dropped the charges against him just really really Maine is so unique with trials with the way they investigate with their lack of information, with the lack of information to the press, they're unique. Yeah, they are. I find I find it extremely odd that he's he was convicted. He served 25 years. He is now out, but he's not exonerated. He's still convicted with that murder. Yeah. I mean, he was released on $25,000 bail. They imp- imposed standard conditions, no alcohol, no drugs. Uh, he was. He still has to check in weekly with the police in Westbrook, Maine. Um, he's allowed to live with his wife, and um, until the process goes forward, he was sentenced originally to seventy years, which is pretty much life. Mm-hmm. Um, I did read also that, however, with all this information. Her family still is convinced that he was the one that killed her. Yep. I did see that too. They do not believe that he's innocent. Mm -hmm. And in looking at the details of this case, it was interesting to see as well that two criminal profilers definitely, when looking at the case, suggested that Jessica was more likely a victim of a serial killer as opposed to this singular event. Um, Now, these serial killers in the article that I was reading from um, Central Maine, two different profilers, one of them you guys are going to hear as familiar as we've talked about him before, John Philpin, was actually uh, quoted in this article, and also Greg McCreary. McCreary worked uh, 25 years in the FBI. So he's a profiler along with John Philpin. In looking at the details of the case, they really saw a lot of similarities between Jessica's case and Barbara Agnew's case, Um, specific to, I mean, obviously the wounds that we spoke about a little bit earlier, but it was really after reviewing autopsy records. So just with the reports filed from these two profilers as well, I'm wondering if they're sort of in an information gathering phase in trying to go into essentially a new trial for him. Yeah. But have they looked at any other suspects outside of Anthony Sanborn since? It doesn't. 1989. It doesn't appear. It doesn't appear like they have. 
or at least that information hasn't been made uh, public in any way. All the articles that I read, which I kept seeing over and over again, was those two detectives still feel that he is guilty of this crime. Mm -hmm. They still feel that um, he's the suspect, the only suspect. And um, they believe that he was the one that that killed Jessica. Yep. Um, so they, they are not steering away from that at all. So the possibilities of them looking at someone else just is, um, yeah, I don't, I don't believe that they are. Yeah, it doesn't sound likely. So not only is this case extremely unique in that, you know, it's so it's technically it's a solved case, right? It's a solved case with a conviction. However, he's out on quote bail after serving 25 years. And I guess that there's going to be another trial or or something. Um, but with all of the pieces of evidence or with all of the witness accounts, it's interesting that all of them are essentially sort of being like discredited and or recanted and sort of explained the process that the police and the detectives took during the investigation is sort of come into question. And then we also have a couple of um, profilers coming in and saying, actually, signs are actually pointing in this direction as a possibility as well. So there's all these things that are coming into question, although Anthony Sanborn is still convicted of this murder. I really just thought that we should actually dig into Jessica Briggs just a little bit more and educate ourselves a little bit on it, not just with what Philpin has actually divulged to us before in us digging into possible other cases that might be connected to the Connecticut River Valley cases, over in Maine, um, but also in our conversations with Jen, we know that based off of what she actually dug into in her process with Dark Valley, that she was getting the same sort of information and the same sort of feel as well. So I know that Jessica Briggs is definitely one of those cases. Yeah. And the sad thing about it is, you know, her, in my mind, in my opinion, her case is still unsolved. Right. Um. Yeah, they may have convicted this the Sanborn guy, but I mean, everything that I have read um, with his hearing and his bail hearing and all the other stuff, like what they actually convicted him with the evidence that they actually used to convict him, I have a hard time thinking that he was the one that murdered her. He was only 16. They had no forensics at all like no blood no I, I haven't seen any of that in any of the articles that any of that stuff was was used in the trial all I see is witnesses and now not just one but um, a few of the witnesses have come forward and recanted their story and you know said that you know, this is how I was interviewed. And th this um, Hope Katie, her parents actually came forward too and was quite angry that they took their daughter in the room and interviewed her for hours without them even knowing. They picked her up and done a few interviews with her at the station and her parents didn't even know she was being interviewed. Um, so her parents weren't present with a lot of these interviews, if any of them, which is so wrong. I mean, she was under age too. Yeah. So I don't understand how they could get away with, with doing something like that and why that was never brought up with his initial, his initial trial. Right. So, I mean, there was, there's so many things that are so wrong with this whole case. I'd like to know who the heck the judge was on his initial case when he was convicted and and what this judge was thinking and why he allowed so much of this stuff in as evidence. I mean, to me, we as a society, we as, um, especially me as a victim, you want to make sure the right person is being convicted. Mm -hmm. And I understand sometimes the authorities are under a lot of pressure to solve a case. Find a person that's 
a good suspect and charge them and let the jury decide. Um, but I get that sometimes they are under pressure to solve a case. But damn, you gotta you gotta convict the right person. <laughs> right. You know, I I did a lot of reading the past couple of days trying to find more information about Jessica Briggs and more information about her case. And I'm kind of curious, you know, were there other cases in Maine similar to hers after hers? Right. You know, because if you don't convict the right person, that monster is still out there killing. Mm -hmm. You know, the person that actually did the murders is still out there killing. And, you know, I, I just feel it's, yeah, it's important to convict the monsters that are actually doing the killing, but it's also really super important to convict the right person. Yeah. yeah, I know a lot of people are like, well, you know, you ask a serial killer or, or a killer and they always say, oh, you know, I'm innocent and, you know, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And and I realize sometimes, you know, a lot of times, you know, the guilty do try to claim that they're innocent. But I'm just baffled how this kid was convicted on what I've read <laughs> Of what I read, if I was on that jury, I don't, I don't know that I would have convicted. I would have needed more, more evidence. Um, but evidently, I don't know. I, I can't really judge. I wasn't on the jury. I wasn't in the courtroom during this trial. Right. But what I'm reading now, I, it's hard to believe that they convicted this kid on what they had. Right. Of what I'm reading. Any. He was only 16 and he, he served 25 years yeah. in prison for something he very most likely did not commit. And I can understand the family because of course you want to know that who did this to my, to my daughter and you want to see justice. And when, um, you got the authorities and the detectives sitting there and they're totally convinced that it's him. And they sit there and they convince the family that it's him. You know, I, I can totally sympathize with the family and, and what they've gone through and what they possibly had to go through in the courtroom. But you got to look at this with an open mind too. You know, as much as you want to see justice, you want to make sure you're seeing the right person go to jail you know, and you're receiving justice by the right person going to jail and being convicted of, of this murder. So I, I totally sympathize with the family, but the family is completely convinced it was him. They have put that out there publicly. Yep. And um, it's sad, sad for them. Yeah. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. And now back to our episode. Yeah. So as far as ties um, Jessica Briggs to the Connecticut Valley. There are some things that, you know, lend credibility to that, you know, such as her uh, neck being slit and her abdomen being slit too. Um, that definitely fits the pattern of the Connecticut Valley killings. Um, now, when we were looking into the timing of her death, so we developed, we were able to identify a pattern when we looked at all the Connecticut Valley killings, such as the time of day. All the nighttime attacks were on the weekends. All the late morning attacks or midday attacks were during the week. There's a pattern that we've just come up with. We have no idea if it's just a coincidence or whatnot, but as far as patterns go, it's the only pattern that we've been able to see when you look at the Connecticut Valley killings. But when you look at Jessica Briggs, so they say that her death was either late during the night on Tuesday late, late evening or early morning hours on a Wednesday. So that if we look at the timing pattern, it would not fall into it um, yeah, because yeah. it would have been a late early morning attack during a weekday. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. Now, does that have any credibility? No, whatsoever. It really was a theory that we've kind of come up with. Does it mean anything? Who the hell knows? But it's just another piece of the puzzle um, that we're bringing forward. Yeah, and moving all the way up to Maine, going that far up to Maine, that is kind of like odd to me too. 
but you can't refute the the stab pattern and she was also young too she was 16 yeah she was 16 so that would put her about you know bernice's age bernice's age yep and heidi martin so it would be you know like she would be on the lower age range um where Barbara Agnew was on the higher age range. So was he really paying much attention to the age versus um, opportunity, opportunity, victim of opportunity? Yeah. And when we do look at the the women within the Connecticut Valley, you're right. They're all in a little bit older age range when you compare it to a teenager and Bernice being that outlier. But by all accounts, Bernice looked older than she really was. Yeah. Now, with Jessica, do you remember seeing anything as far as did she look like a 16-year-old or did she look like a 20-year-old? She did look like a 16-year-old. Um, yeah, one might, one might be able to argue she looked a few years older than that, maybe. but or maybe a couple. But for the most part, you, you could tell she was a teenager based off of the pictures that I saw online. Yeah. yeah, especially if you look at like Bernice and say Jane, you at the time of your attack age range looked very close i would say yeah. you know pretty similar in age you know jane you at the time definitely did not look like a 16 year old but in early 20s so that was just a question as far as jessica how she held herself and stuff how did she come off did she come off as a, a 16 year old or did she come off as somebody who was older yeah yep that's a good question yep or victim of opportunity mm-hmm. yep I wish I knew more. I know. It was really frustrating how hard it was to try and find information and dig into information because everything was all about, you know, the Anthony Sanborn update on the case about, you know, him essentially being let out, but then he's still convicted. Everything was about that. It was really hard to find any sort of original information about Jessica Briggs and when she was actually found. I do want to go make sure and make note, though, and I mean, this is just an assumption that I'm making, but I didn't see it noted in any of the articles that we could find. She was found within, I would say, hours of being murdered, right? That's a true statement in, in assuming that because she was found at, what, 1030 in the morning? And they weren't sure if she was murdered, like, night, early morning, that sort of thing, right? Yeah, so you would assume that she was found within a 12-hour period of when she was murdered. At the most, yep. So she was found within hours. There was no mention of sexual assault. No. I just wanted, the, the, in any article that I could actually find, there was no mention that she was actually, there was only mention of her wounds and that she was killed and, you know, her age, but there was no mention of sexual assault. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out there. So kind of like similar to hers and then similar to, right, Linda Moore, who was found, you know, minutes almost like an hour or or less um so with the bodies that were found very very soon and you know decomposition and actually started occurring yet there was proof that there was no sexual assault with the connecticut river valley cases so that would that actually tell us you know we don't even know where she was found was she found in the woods along a shoreline yep portland pier so most likely she wasn't transported or anything. She was mm-hmm. killed right where she was found Yep, and left where she was killed. Yep. So that's unusual too. That's kind of different from the other cases Yep. because all the other cases, um, they were taken, they were taken and then killed where they were taken to. So that's, that's kind of. Except for Linda Moore. Except for Linda Moore. And Kathy Linda. Milliken. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's it's one of those where not yeah, a couple of the victims within the Connecticut Valley were transported. Others, Jane, you would have been one that would have been left at the scene as well, um, if you weren't able to recover. But he tried to take me with him. Yeah, he tried. So he did want to transport yeah. me. So we do wonder too. Did he try that with Kathy? Did he try that yeah. with uh, Linda? Yeah. And if it is the same person, did he try that with Jessica? So yeah, as far as the no sexual assault. And the stab pattern, those are, you know, the two pieces that do kind of line up with the Connecticut River Valley uh, killings. And as far as the transport versus non-transport, we do have examples of both happening. Now, whether that was due to lack of being able to transport them or not, that's a question that's still up in the air. 
Because mm-hmm. you're right, he did try to transport you, Jane. But after yep. he attacked you, he didn't try to, like after no. you were on the ground, he didn't try to pick you up and put him into his vehicle. No. Yep. No. So that kind of tells me that um, even with the other cases, he transported them and where their bodies was fa- were found is where he murdered them. Mm-hmm. Because had he, I mean, he would have transported me. I was stabbed 27 times. So why didn't he transport me after he stabbed me? You know, I don't know. But yeah. the others, I mean, to me, that just tells me that the others were alive. He transported them and then killed them where they were found. My opinion. Right, because Jen wasn't able to find any evidence, at least that was where the bodies were found, that that's where the killings happened. But there wasn't also any evidence to kind of say they were killed and brought there. It was just right. due to the timing, there was no unable to see if there was, that's where, you know, the altercation took place and whatnot. Yeah. Yep. I'm definitely going to continue to dig with this. Um, I want to know more about her, maybe um, try and contact family. There's not a lot of coverage on this. Um, I know Jen did a little bit. Did she do a little bit with Dark Valley? I know she has mentioned it to us. I don't think on Dark Valley. I don't think she mentioned anything on Dark Valley. I think she only mentioned something to us when we were interviewing her and in our conversations with her. And John Philpin mentioned her when we interviewed him. Yep. So we're going to try and and do some more digging with Jessica Briggs. Um, Again, this is how we get our info. If anybody out there uh, knows anything about her, knows anything about her case, something that we should be talking about, email us, message us. We would love to know more about Jessica Briggs. Uh, You guys helped us out in the past. Maybe you'll help us out again. Because, I, I mean, this... I have so many questions with so many things with this case. And um, I, I'm hoping that maybe the more I learn about Jessica Briggs will answer a lot of my questions. And um, the more we learn about her case, not necessarily the case about Sanborn or that hearing or anything like that, really would like to know more about her. her. In her case. Mm -hmm. Um, So, again, if anybody knows anything about it, I know we have some listeners in Maine. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe they can help us out, send us some articles, email us. uh, We'll get back to you. And hopefully we can uh, find out more information to share. Um, I think it's important. I think I personally would consider her case still unsolved and i think it's i think it's important to get her story out and uh go from there Mm -hmm. i agree anything else dad over here joe you did a good job i loved how you uh put some of that stuff together because it gives me it makes me ask more questions now too Mm -hmm. (laughs) right yeah yeah um yeah i'd be be interesting to know more so with that if we're all set thank you for listening to invisible tears subscribe uh tell your friends about us tell strangers you don't have to be friends with them walk up to anybody on the street hey have a listen to this go on our facebook page and like us (laughs) and share share our facebook page find us on tiktok you know, like us on TikTok, follow us, uh, all that stuff. Instagram, you can find us there. Yeah, Instagram. And YouTube if you want to watch us do this, not just listen to us. <laughs> Absolutely. Go to YouTube and watch us. Sometimes we make funny faces. I don't know. We do. <laughs> we absolutely do. <laughs> um, yeah, please help us, follow us, uh, share. Share, 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 Uh, subscribe, all that good stuff. So with that, we're out.
Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Invisible Tears. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast to hear all future episodes. Click into our link tree too in the episode description to find and follow us on all our social medias. And it also links to our website, invisible-tears.com, where you can keep current on any events that may be coming up, read more about Jane and the team, and read more about all the Connecticut River Valley unsolved cases. If you want to learn more about my wellness practice, Guided Path Wellness, head to guidedpathwellness.org. There you can read more about me and my certifications, more about the Reiki and coaching services I offer both in person and remote, and read all about my products for sale that I make through the practice. Feel free to utilize the contact us section on the website with any questions or utilize that free 15 minute consultation booking button if you have any questions about what might work for you. Evil may exist in this world, but we will not let it win. See you next episode.